Good morning. So we are waiting, actually waiting uh, for the hearing into um, what actually happened uh, with the former president of the United States of America uh, in terms of the assassination attempt. There have been so many conspiracy theories, so many videos which have been analysed left, right and centre. Um, the cable news stations have literally gorged themselves with speculation. Uh, the one thing that has sadly been missing from everything has been the truth. Uh, hopefully, with this hearing, we will find out the truth. We will get an opportunity, you will get an opportunity to hear the uh, Secret Service personnel, the Secret Service members be questioned and answer what really went on. And this is something where I hope there's a level of a uh, uh, bipartisan. I hope it doesn't fall down uh, on party lines. Uh, I hope it doesn't fall down in terms of conspiracy theories. Uh, right now, if you ask me directly, do I think that the former president of the United States of America was shot with a, or his ear, what caused the damage to his ear? Do I personally think it was a bullet? The answer is no, but that's my personal interpretation. No doubt you have your own interpretation. And very shortly, once the hearing starts, we'll be in a position to hear what the Secret Service have to say. And fortunately, we don't need to worry about them going under oath because they will be telling us the truth. And as we head into uh, November 5th, and uh, the, well, it's 14 days, uh, where is it? 14 days, 14 weeks and six days uh, before the election cycle kicks off in full. The truth is something we really do need to get a grasp of. Uh, so uh, Director Cheetal uh, will be present. We're just waiting for them um, to arrive. I do, in fact, I go to the bigger screen. I can show you behind me. Uh, one second, here we go. Uh, right, the bigger screen behind me, you can see they are arriving very, very shortly. And uh, as soon as they arrive, we will uh, be going. There is the director of the uh, American Secret Service who is arriving, and she'll be cross-examined. And you, again, as I said, this is probably one of the most important hearings for a while. You'll get to hear and see, as it happens, the truth, right? No more conspiracy theories, no more talking heads, no more projections, no more just, right, let's say something which works with the political narrative. Uh, Speaker Johnson is outside, seeing if you can get some lost. Uh, he's, so Speaker Johnson, by the way, is complaining uh, about Joe Biden moving along. Uh, he just speaks a load of rubbish. Uh, so we are literally waiting for the hearing to start. Um, this is a live shot of the, uh, in case you're wondering, uh, there is a live shot. We're waiting. As soon as the cameras come up, I will stop uh, talking. Uh, feel free in the comments section, by the way, while we're waiting uh, for our live camera uh, actually in the hearing, feel free to let me know your thoughts with regards to the the ear. Do you think the bullet? Uh, I do think we're almost close. Sound should be with us soon, and uh, we can hear and see live what will happen. Uh, channel is Tony Doughty, 24-7 Eyes. Thank you for choosing us. We're about to go live for a very important uh, Committee on Oversight and Accountability on... Um, on what happened on this hearing of the committee on oversight and accountability will come to order I want to welcome everyone here today and i know we also want to welcome speaker johnson uh, who is also uh, in attendance today without objection the chair may declare a recess at any time i now uh, recognize myself for the purpose of making an opening statement but first without objection uh representative mills of florida and Representative Miller of Ohio are waived onto the committee for the purpose of questioning the witness at today's hearing. Without objection to order. Good morning. 
Today's hearing is for the American people who are seeking answers about the attempted assassination of President Trump. A little over a week ago, American wa Americans watched in horror as a shooter attempted to assassinate President Donald J. Trump at a campaign rally in Butler, Pennsylvania. The gunman nearly succeeded. The bullet that struck President Trump's head was less than an inch from taking his life. President Trump survived, but one rally goer, Corey Comparator, tragically did not. Two others were seriously injured. It was a horrifying moment in American history. The horror was exceeded only by the bravery of the law enforcement agents who threw themselves in harm's way when shots were fired. The bravery of a crowd unwavering in its refusal to panic and the bravery of a bloody President Trump refusing to run. While we give overwhelming thanks to the individual Secret Service agents who did their jobs under immense pressure, this tragedy was preventable. The Secret Service's protective mission is to protect U.S. and visiting world leaders and safeguard U.S. elections through protection of candidates and nominees. The Secret Service has a zero-fail mission, but it failed on July 13th and in the days leading up to the rally. The Secret Service has thousands of employees and a significant budget, but it has now become the face of incompetence. The committee has a long track record of providing oversight of the Secret Service. Our predecessors, both Jason Chaffetz and Elijah Cummings, among others, worked together to issue warnings and recommendations to address obvious shortcomings in the agency's makeup and operations. Unfortunately, those warnings and recommendations have gone unheeded. A former president and current candidate for president was shot in the head by a sniper within 500 feet of the podium. This is unacceptable, and we are concerned the Secret Service lacks the proper management to keep protectees safe from bad actors. Americans demand answers, but they have not been getting them from the Secret Service. We are instead learning about new facts about the events surrounding the attempted assassination every day from whistleblowers and leaks. Americans demand accountability, but no one is yet to be fired for this historic failure. Today's witness, Secret Service Director Kimberly Cheadle, is here under subpoena to answer questions about how the agency failed President Trump and the victims who attended the rally in Butler, Pennsylvania. It is my firm belief, Director Cheadle, that you should resign. However, in complete defiance, Director Cheadle has maintained she will not tender her resignation. Therefore, she will answer questions today from members of this committee seeking to provide clarity to the American people about how these events were allowed to transpire. We will ask these questions because the Secret Service and its parent agency, the Department of Homeland Security, have been unwilling to provide answers to the American people. DHS has sought to push this hearing to a different time Secret Service has suggested the hearing occur without media presence, and both agencies have provided only shallow explanations to Congress about what happened on July 13th. Indeed, DHS and Secret Service's lack of communication with the Oversight Committee required me to issue a subpoena compelling Director Cheadle to attend today, and still DHS requested more time to prepare. It shouldn't take this much time or preparation Director Cheadle, to tell the truth and to be transparent with the American people. I am thankful to the ranking member, Mr. Raskin, for joining me and insisting that Director Cheadle appear today. God knows the ranking member and I disagree on many things, but that does not matter today. The safety of Secret Service protectees is not based on their political affiliation, and the bottom line is that under Director Cheadle's leadership, we question whether anyone is safe not President Biden, not the First Lady, not the White House, and certainly not the presidential candidates. The July 13th assassination attempt is one of the darkest days in American political history. It represents the ugliest parts of what American politics has become, hatred of each other and a dangerous turn to extremism. Before we were Republicans or Democrats, we are Americans. 
If we place our political affiliations above our duty and love of country, we cannot maintain a country. We must ensure our republic is strong, and our republic cannot be strong when our leadership, our elections, our institutions, and our candidates are threatened by extremism and violence. Today, Director Cheadle will answer questions about why she deserves to continue to play a critical role in preserving this country's safety and, at the very least, what led to the catastrophic, deadly events on July 13th in Butler, Pennsylvania. Again, I do not believe Director Cheadle deserves to maintain her position as head of the Secret Service, but members of the America and the American people will make their own decisions based on her answers today. I urge Director Cheadle to be transparent and forthcoming in her testimony today. Americans deserve no less. We have a duty to find out how this happened and to ensure it never happens again. I now yield to Ranking Member Raskin for his opening statement. <clears throat> Thank you kindly, Chairman Comer. Uh, Elijah Cummings, whose beautiful visage looks down upon us, taught us that, that the way to find common ground in a crisis is to look for the higher ground. And last week, Chairman Comer and I came together to reach for that higher ground. We made a joint statement condemning the mass shooting and assassination attempt against former President Trump as a grave assault on our democracy. As we wrote, we are united in condemning all political violence. I join the good chairman in expressing condolences to the family of Corey Comparatori and in sending healing wishes to the wounded victims also of this atrocious act of violence. Some are calling it a miracle that former President Trump escaped this AR-15 attack. Unlike so many thousands of our fellow citizens who have been killed or seriously wounded in other AR-15 shootings, whether this miracle is of divine provenance or of an adventitious nature will be up to each of us to ponder, but our job in Congress is not simply to marvel at miracles or count on good luck, but to act as public policy legislators to do whatever we can to prevent future pub political violence, attempted assassinations, and mass shootings. The chairman and I are thus determined to get to the bottom of the stunning security failures that enabled this 20-year-old lone gunman who borrowed his father's AR-15 to perpetrate a mass shooting and assassination attempt at an event protected by the Secret Service as well as state and local police. We'll ask hard questions of Director Cheadle today in order to identify and understand the shocking security failures that occurred and to help transform the operations of the Secret Service to prevent anything like this from happening again. But we can't let ourselves off the hook either, dear colleagues. What happened in Butler, Pennsylvania was a double failure, the failure by the Secret Service to properly protect former President Trump and the failure of Congress to properly protect our people from criminal gun violence. We must therefore also ask hard questions about, about whether our laws are making it too easy for potential assassins to obtain firearms generally in the AR-15 specifically. Mr. Comparatore, former President Trump, and the other rally attendees wounded in Butler are now members of a club no one wants to belong to, the thousands of people who have fallen victim to mass shootings. Last year, we had 655 mass shootings in America, defined as four or more people being shot or killed in a single event, not including the shooter. 712 people died and nearly 2,700 people were wounded in these attacks in 2023. Mass shootings are commonplace. They happen at political rallies and constituent meetings, in our elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools, in churches, synagogues, and mosques, in movie theaters and parades, in nightclubs and grocery stores, in concerts, and on street corners. Here are the worst mass shootings in the last uh, 11 or 12 years. The list is a grim reminder of the horrific damage and death wrought by assault weapons and the AR-15 in particular that have taken the lives of <clears throat> our children, parents, colleagues, and neighbors. This is a, a, a very partial list. Mass shootings have become so frequent that we don't even hear about them anymore. Since the mass shooting in Butler, there have already been at least 10 additional mass shootings in America, two of which took place the same day that former President Trump was targeted. One of the mass shootings <clears throat> on that violent Saturday, July 13th, happened at 11 p.m. at a nightclub in Birmingham, Alabama, where four people were shot dead and 10 others wounded. 
This means amazingly that the Butler attack was not even the deadliest mass shooting to happen in America on that day. A weapon that can be used to commit a mass shooting in an event under the full protection of the Secret Service, together with dozens of state and local police, is obviously an intolerable threat to the rest of us who do not receive such protection and obviously does not belong in our communities. It's time to pass universal background checks and build on this administration's work to ensure that we permanently close the loopholes in the Brady Law for gun show purchases, online purchases, and private sales to prevent those weapons from getting into the hands of people we know to be a threat to others. What happened in Butler shows why even closing these loopholes, however, will not keep assault weapons out of the hands of potential assassins and mass murderers. Under federal law and in the vast majority of states, even young people not old enough to buy a beer legally can legally purchase and own the AR-15 and carry it in public. The shooter in Butler used his father's AR-15. We have to find the courage and resolve to pass a ban on the AR-15 and other assault weapons. A ban has broad support. Even the New York Post loudly endorsed such a ban in 2019. We have passed an assault weapons ban before. Republicans and Democrats together passed it in 1994. Alas, in 2004, we allowed the ban to expire. We know this weapons ban worked. One study found that in the decade that followed the ban's lapse, mass shootings went back up 183% and deaths from mass shootings went up 239%. But even as we change the Secret Service and act to ban weapons of war like the AR-15, we still will have fallen short of our duty if we fail to denounce every instance of politically motivated violence in whatever form it takes. Republicans and Democrats, again, have come together to denounce this assassination attempt, just as we did the violent attempts on the lives of our colleagues, Representative Stephen Scalise and Representative Gabby Giffords, and on Paul Pelosi, the husband of Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who was attacked and brutalized in his home. And in the immediate aftermath of the January 6th mass violence waged against Congress and the Vice President and the constitutional transfer of power, Democrats and Republicans alike, including Senator McConnell, Chairman Comer, and other colleagues all denounced this violent assault on our democracy that wounded approximately 140 officers from the U.S. Capitol Police and the Metropolitan Police Department. And I commend them for acting to uh, denounce that attack, just as Democrats move swiftly to denounce the attack on Congressman Calise. Scalise. Police scientists, political scientists tell us that authoritarian attacks on democratic institutions begin with political parties refusing to disavow or openly embracing political violence. We have to reject that on a strong bipartisan basis, as Chairman Comer and I have done, even as we ensure our Secret Service is up to its vital task of protecting presidents and candidates, and as we work to ensure that America the streets of our country are free from the violence of weapons of war. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back to you. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Today, we are joined by Kimberly Cheadle, who was sworn into office on September 17, 2022, as the director of the United States Secret Service. Prior to her appointment, Director Cheadle was senior director of global security at PepsiCo. Before her role at Pepsi, she served 27 years in the Secret Service. Pursuant to Committee Rule 9G, the witness will please stand and raise her right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that the witness answered in the affirmative. Thank you. Uh, we certainly appreciate you being here today and look forward to your testimony. Uh, we're, we normally limit testimony to uh, opening statement to five minutes, but take all the time that you need, uh, obviously, the rules that, that we will uh, abide by when you're uh, finished with your statement, we will then turn to questions. Each member will have five minutes. And just a note to the members, I'm going to strictly adhere to the five minutes. Uh, once five minutes is up, I will hit the gavel. Uh, if the director is in the process of answering a question, we'll certainly let her uh, finish her answers and then we will move on. We have, uh, we're gonna have about 100% attendance here today, plus a few additional uh, add-ons. So uh, this will be a, a very lengthy hearing and we wanna make sure every member uh, gets their five minutes uninterrupted. 
uh, to be able to ask these important questions in this very uh, bipartisan hearing today. I now recognize Director Cheadle uh, for your opening statement. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Comer, Ranking Member Raskin, and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Kimberly Cheadle, and I'm the Director of the United States Secret Service. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. The assassination attempt of former President Donald Trump on July 13th is the most significant operational failure of the Secret Service in decades, and I am keeping him and his family in my thoughts. I would like to offer my sincerest condolences to the family of Corey Comparator, a former fire chief and a hero who was killed in this senseless shooting. I would also like to acknowledge those who were injured in Butler, David Dutch, and James Copenhagen, and I wish them a speedy recovery. I would be remiss if I did not also extend my condolences on the passing of your colleague, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Ms. Jackson Lee was always engaged in the oversight of the Secret Service, and her passing is a great loss to this body. The Secret Service's solemn mission is to protect our nation's leaders. On July 13th, we failed. As a director of the United States Secret Service, I take full responsibility for any security lapse of our agency. We are fully cooperating with ongoing investigations. We must learn what happened, and I will move heaven and earth to ensure that an incident like July 13th does not happen again. Let me state unequivocally, nothing I have said should be interpreted to place blame for this failure on our federal, state, or local law enforcement partners who supported the Secret Service in Butler. We could not do our job without them. We rely on the relationships built over years of working together to secure events and conduct investigations. Our agents, officers, and support personnel understand that every day we are expected to sacrifice our lives to execute a no-fail mission. As witnessed on July 13th, our special agents shielded former President Trump with their own bodies on stage for being fired. Selflessly willing to make the ultimate sacrifice without hesitation, I am proud beyond words of the actions taken by the former president's detail the counter sniper team who neutralized the gunman, and the tactical team who was prepared to act. I will be transparent as possible when I speak with you, understanding though at times that I may be limited in providing a thorough response in this open setting due to associated risks with sharing highly sensitive protective methodologies. I do not wanna inadvertently provide you today with inaccurate information. Since January 1st, 2024, the Secret Service has successfully secured over 7,500 sites. Every protective advance comes with its own set of challenges and requires a customized mitigation strategy, including specific assets. Security plans are multi-layered, providing 360 degrees of protection. These layers include personnel, technical, and tactical assets, which are a force multiplier for our protective posture. During every advance, we attempt to strike a balance between enabling the protectee to be visible and our protective requirements to be secure. I know this because I have spent 29 years in this agency. I came up through the ranks. I've secured events for every president since President Clinton, supervised on Vice President Cheney's detail, led our training center, oversaw all of the investigations and protective visits in the state of Georgia, supervised on Vice President Biden's detail, and the agency's entire protective mission during the Trump administration. The comprehensive advance process involves collaborative planning between our Secret Service, the protectees staff, local law enforcement partners, and the level of security provided for the former president increased well before the campaign and has been steadily increasing as threats evolve. The security plan included a full assessment of the Butler Farm showgrounds to identify security vulnerabilities and craft a security plan for the protectee, attendees, and the public. Immediately following the assassination attempt, I directed the activation of my crisis center. I assembled my executive team to begin surging more protective resources to the former president and to ensure the wellness of our people post-incident, all while securing an active crime scene. I immediately ordered a reevaluation of the Republican National Convention security plan and I increased the security posture in the National Capital Region for all permanent protectees and sites. 
At the same time, I initiated a mission assurance investigation within our agency. I have instructed my team that all necessary resources will be dedicated to investigating these matters. We will not rest until we have explored every option and we will leave no stone unturned. But I want to be clear, I am not waiting for these investigations to be completed prior to making changes. Over the past two weeks, we successfully led the planning and execution of the 75th NATO Summit and the Republican National Convention. Over the next few months, we will implement security plans for the Democratic National Convention, the United Nations General Assembly, and have already begun planning and coordinating the 2025 inauguration. It is now more important than ever for the men and women of the Secret Service to remain resilient and to focus on what is necessary to carry out our critical mission. Our agency needs to be adequately resourced in order to serve our current mission requirements and anticipate future requirements. The Secret Service currently protects 36 individuals on a daily basis, as well as world leaders who visit the United States, like Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who arrived in Washington, D.C. today. The coming years will bring an unprecedented heavy protection tempo. I have no doubt that the processes that I have impl implemented during my tenure as director, in addition to my nearly 30 years of experience in this agency, have positioned the Secret Service to be stronger. Our mission is not political. It is literally a matter of life and death. And the tragic events on July 13th remind us of that. I have full confidence in the men and women of the Secret Service. They are worthy of our support in executing our protective mission. I will now answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you very much, Director Cheadle. We'll now begin our, our five minutes uh, questions and I will begin. Just for the record, the Secret Service has an annual budget of around $3.1 billion, and I believe around 8,000 employees, is that correct? Yes, sir. Obviously, there were many security failures on the day of the attempted assassination and leading up to that day. Let's start with the building that the shooter used to shoot President Trump from. At any point Saturday, did the Secret Service have an agent on top of that roof? Sir, I'm sure as you can imagine that we are just nine days out from this uh, incident and there's still an ongoing investigation. And so I want to make sure that any information that we are providing so, to you so, is so factual. You, you can't, okay. Why did the Secret Service not, can you answer why the Secret Service didn't place a single agent on the roof? We are still looking into the advanced process and the decisions right, that right. were made. Okay, okay. Let's, wasn't that building within the perimeter that should be secured? Do we agree with that? The building was outside of the perimeter on the day of the visit, but again, that is one of the things that during the investigation we want to take a look at and determine whether or not other decisions should have been made. One of the things that you said, I believe in an interview, that there wasn't an agent on the roof because it was a slope roof, is that is that normal and do you fear that that immediately creates an opportunity for future would-be assassins to look for a slanted roof? I mean, it, it, this is a huge question that every American has. Why wasn't a Secret Service agent on the roof? And there have been reports that agents were supposed to be on the roof, but it was hot that day and they didn't want to be on the roof. Can you answer any of those questions, Director? So I appreciate you asking me that question, Chairman. Uh, I should have been more clear in my answer when I spoke about where we place personnel in that interview. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, there was a plan in place to provide overwatch and we are still looking into responsibilities and who was going to provide overwatch. Uh, but the Secret Service in general, not speaking specifically to this incident, when we are providing overwatch, whether that be through counter snipers or other technology, okay. prefer to have sterile rooftops. Did the Secret Service use any drones for surveillance that day? So again, I'm not gonna get into specifics of that day in itself, but there are times uh, during the security plan that the Secret Service does deploy an asset like a drone. There were reports that the shooter used a drone just a few hours before the rally start time. Is that accurate? I have heard those same reports and again am waiting for the final report. Do you know, if you can't answer the question, that's your answer. But can you answer this? Do you know, do you know, I'm not asking yes or no, but do you know if the shooter used a drone before the shooting. That information has been passed to us from the FBI. How many Secret Service agents were assigned to President Trump on the day of the rally? 
Again, I'm not going to get into the specifics of the numbers of personnel that we had there, but we feel that there was a sufficient number of agents assigned. There are reports that several agents assigned to the rally on July 13th were, were temporary agents, agents not normally assigned to President Trump. Is that accurate? What I can tell you is that the agents that were assigned to former President Trump are Secret Service agents that provide close protection to him, and that was what was actual on that day. How many temporary agents were there that day? Quite frequently, sir, during campaign events, uh, the Secret Service utilizes uh, agents from HSI or the Department of but Homeland you, Security. You don't know how many supplement you can't answer. our plan. Have the investigators reconstructed the shooter's precise movements over the past days, weeks, and months? So, again, we, we, we need we need to have confidence that if the FBI is leading this investigation, that they're leading a credible investigation. Because there's some of us sitting up here today that don't have a lot of confidence in the FBI. So I will repeat the question. Have the investigators reconstructed the shooter's precise moments over the past days, weeks, and months? I understand your question, Chairman, and I share your concerns about wanting to make sure that we have factual information. The FBI is conducting a criminal investigation. The Secret Service is conducting an internal investigation. There are a number of OIG investigations, and there is the external investigation okay. that the President- la la Last question for me. Before July 13th, had the Trump detail requested additional resources? What I can tell you is that for the event on July 13th, the details that were requested, the, the assets that were requested for that day were given. Okay. My time has expired. Chair now recognizes ranking member asking for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's been uh, reported that before former President Trump got up on the stage at around 6 p.m. on Saturday, July 13th, that the local police had identified and even photographed a man who was acting suspiciously. And this man who turned out to be the gunman had been flagged as a potential threat. Is that accurate? What I can say is that the individual was identified as suspicious. So he was known to be suspicious before former President Trump took the stage. That is the information I have received. Why was he allowed to take the stage with a suspicious person having been identified in the crowd? So I appreciate the question and I'd like to make two points. If the detail had been passed information that there was a threat, the detail would never have brought the former president out onto stage. That is what we do and that is who we are. We are charged with protecting uh, all, all of our protectees. So you distinguish between someone who, who is suspicious and someone who's threatening, is that we right? Do. There are a number of times at protective events where suspicious people are identified and those individuals have to be investigated and determined what is it that identifies that person as suspicious. So did you deny um, a request for additional resources that had been made by uh, the Trump campaign? There were no assets denied for that event in Butler on the 13th. I see. So you're saying there were requests made for additional assistance for other specific events rather than for the campaign as a whole. Is that right? I'm sorry, I'm not understanding. Well, you seem to say that there were not additional resources requested for that event. And uh, forgive me for being unfamiliar with this. Is it requested event by event or is it requested just in general for the campaign? So if I can explain the advanced process, uh, when, the, when a, an event or in a venue is identified by, in this case, campaign staff, uh, then the campaign staff works together with Secret Service agents who go out and conduct an advance. Generally, that is a five-day time period uh, where those discussions are had about what the perimeter is going to look like, what the size of the event is, what the venue is. And then from there, uh, there is a request made uh, to mitigate potential risk and threat. And I'm saying that on that day, the requests that were pushed forward were granted. So the Secret Service did not know that the gunman actually had a weapon before President Trump was allowed to get up on the stage? To the best of our knowledge and the facts that we have at this point, that is correct. Um, so can you answer this question, which I think is on the mind of most Americans thinking about this? How can a 20-year-old with his father's AR-15 assault weapon climb onto a roof with a direct 
150 yard line of sight to the speaker's podium without the Secret Service or local police stopping him. So again, sir, I will say we are nine days out from this event, and I would like to know those answers as well, which is why we are going through these investigations to be able to determine that fully. Okay. Um, it's been reported that the shooter was not carrying a driver's license or any form of identification. Um, they had no idea who he was, but then he was quickly identified, I think within 30 minutes, by using the serial number on the AR-15 um, under a tracing system that is now controversial. Some people say we should get rid of it. Some people want to keep it. But is that right that the serial number was the key information which led to the identification of the shooter? That is my understanding, sir. Yes. Okay. Um, if if an American citizen were just to stop you and say, Director Cheadle, we support your work to the tune of billions of dollars and thousands and thousands of employees, what went wrong? What would you say? Again, knowing that we're nine days out, I would say, as I have said from the very outset, I accept responsibility for this tragedy. Uh, we are going to look into how this happened, and we are going to take corrective action to ensure that it never happens again. Well, I appreciate that, um, and, and I hope you will act with uh, vigor and focus and intensity, and it seems you understand the, the gravity and solemnity of this to the American people. Um, millions and millions of Americans don't feel safe with all the AR-15s out there. We thought at least the president of the United States or a former president of the United States would be safe, but now that's not even clear. Mr. Chairman, I yield back to you. Gentlemen, yours back. Chair, now recognize the Chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, Mr. Jordan from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director, were you guessing or lying? The day after President Trump is shot, Secret Service spokesman Anthony Gugliami said, quote, the assertion that a member of the former president's security team requested additional security resources that the U.S. Secret Service or the Department of Homeland Security rebuffed is absolutely false. The next day, Secretary Mayorkas said that is an unequivocally false assertion. We had not received any request for additional security measures that were rebuffed. But five days later, The Washington Post said this. Top officials repeatedly rejected requests from Donald Trump's security detail for more personnel. The next day, the New York Times said this, Mr. Guglielmi acknowledged that the Secret Service had turned down some requests for additional federal security assets for Mr. Trump's detail. So which is it? Because both statements can't be true. Were you guessing or lying when you said you didn't turn down requests from President Trump's detail? Neither, sir, and I appreciate the question. Well, what, what were you doing? Because those statements don't, don't jive. So what I can tell you is that for the event in Butler, there were no requests that were denied. As far as requests- Well, maybe they got tired of asking. Maybe you turned them down so darn much, they said, not worth asking. How many times did you turn them down ahead of that? I think that it is important to distinguish between what some people may view as a denial uh, of a, an asset or a request. Well, is Mr. Guglielmi your spokesperson? He said he acknowledged the Secret Service had turned down some requests. I'm asking how many? A denial of a request does not equal a vulnerability. Well, tell me what it is. There are a number of ways that threats and risks can be mitigate, mitigated with a number of different assets, whether that be through personnel, whether that be through technology, or well, other well, resources. Well, tell the committee which it was. They asked for additional help in some form or another. You told them no. How many times did you tell them no, and what did you tell them no to? Again, I cannot speak to specific incidents, but I can tell you in general terms, uh, the Secret Service uh, is judicious with their resources based on- What does some request mean? How many times? Some indicate request is plural. So more than once they asked for additional help, and you turned them down. What did they ask for and how many times did you turn them down? Pretty basic questions. So again, without having all of the details in front of me, sir, what I can tell you is that there are times- You didn't get briefed on how many times you turned down the Trump detail when they asked for additional help? I'm, I'm sorry. You didn't get briefed on that before you came to this hearing, knowing you were gonna get asked that question? What I can tell you is that in generic terms, when people, when, when details make a request, there are times that there are alternate ways to cover off on that threat 
or that risk. But that's not what he said. He said they were denied certain requests, some I, requests. I, this I, is I, your spokesperson, not me talking. This is the Secret Service talking. I and, it, and, and what a change from absolutely false, unequivocally false to, oh, by the way, there were some times where we didn't give them what they wanted. That's a huge change in five days. And the fact that you can't answer how many times you did that, that's pretty darn frustrating, not just for me, but for, for the country. I hear your frustration. Let me ask you this. Were any of those requests denied to President Trump's detail after you knew about the Iranian threat? What I can tell you, again, I don't know the specifics, is that there are times when we can fill a request. It doesn't necessarily have to be with a Secret Service uh, asset or resource. We can fill that request with locally available assets. You spoke to anyone at the White House since July 13th? Yes, I have. Who'd you talk to? I have briefed the president and the vice president. Talk to the first lady? No, I have not. Talk to the White House staff, anyone in the White House communications? No, I have not. Have you talked to the counter sniper who took the shot that took out the bad guy? Yes, I have. And can you tell us about that conversation? I would not want to reveal conversations that I've had with my employees. But that's exactly the kind of information the American people want to know. American people who pay your salary. I understand. This is an ongoing investigation. and I Who's all doing the investigating at Secret Service? I know the inspector general, but is there also an internal investigation in addition to the inspector general? We are conducting a mission assurance investigation internally yes you know what it looks like director it looks like you won't answer some pretty basic questions it looks like you got a nine percent raise and you cut corners when it came to protecting one of the most important individuals most well-known individuals on the planet a former president likely the guy's going to be the next president it looks like you guys were cutting corners that's what it looks like to me is that true i am here today because i want to answer questions but i also want to be cautious. you might want to but you haven't answered i don't think you've answered one question from the chairman the ranking member or, or me well, we got a lot of other people asking. We'll see if your if your record improves. But right now, you haven't answered. I don't think any questions. I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. Chair, now recognize Ms. Norton from Washington D.C. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in the summer of 1963, as a law student, I traveled to the South to work in the civil rights movement. When I arrived in Jackson, Mississippi, I was met by a civil rights activists who showed me around town and tried to convince me to work in Jackson that summer. I recall talking with him and his wife about the raw at atmosphere in Jackson. Later that day, he took me to the bus station for my trip to my assignment. That night, he was assassinated outside his home. His name was Medgar Evers. I condemn the political violence. It is a threat to democracy. I want to discuss one of the roots of political violence, guns. For years, Republicans, including a member of this committee, have introduced legislation and amendments to repeal or block the District of Columbia gun violence protection laws, including its bans on assault weapons and large capacity magazines. The shooter at the Trump rally used the mass shooter's gun of choice, an assault weapon, specifically an AR-15 style wet rifle and presumably a large capacity magazine, which is defined in DC as a magazine that can hold more than 10 bullets. Under current DC law, DC does not recognize concealed carry permits issued by other jurisdictions, but it does uh, issue concealed carry permits to both residents and non-residents. However, DC imposes a number of requirements on concealed carry applicants, including suitability, such as not having exhibited a propensity for violence or instability. Moreover, DC residents where, uh, where the, uh, restricts where the guns can be carried such as a political demonstration near the White House and Naval Observatory or near people under Secret Service protection provided the permit holder has been given notice. This week, the House is expected, expected to consider the fiscal year 2025 financial services and general government appropriations bill. Uh, this Republican drafted bill would allow an individual with a permit to carry a concealed handgun 
issued by a state or territory uh, to carry a concealed handgun in DC, regardless of that jurisdiction's permit requirements. A Republican has filed an amendment to that provision to allow such an individual to carry a magazine of any size with that handgun. In short, the pending bill and amendment would allow any person with a carry permit issued by another jurisdiction to carry a concealed handgun with a magazine of any size in any location in the District of Columbia. The Secret Service is responsible for protecting a large number of people and facilities in DC. D Director Ch Cheadle, uh, would Secret Service protectees in DC be safer or less safe if people who have exhibited a propensity for violence or instability could carry a concealed uh, concealed handguns in DC? I think being a Secret Service agent and an officer or a law enforcement officer in any state is difficult. They are required to make decisions and snap judgments uh, in the blink of an eye. And I think that the officers and the agents that work here in the DC area do a great job of monitoring uh, the public and reacting to threats uh, as appropriate when they uh, arise. Would, would, would C Secret Service protectees in DC be safer or less safe if people in DC could carry concealed handguns with large capacity magazines? I think, ma'am, that we work in parameters where we travel around North America and the rules on open carry and concealed carry uh, are different from state to state. And that is part of what the Secret Service takes into account when we develop a security plan. Obviously, anyone that comes into one of our protective sites, we would establish magnetometer support, uh, metal detectors that personnel would have to process through eliminating that potential. Uh, would Secret Service protectees in DC be safer or less safe if more people could carry handguns uh, in DC? I think again, as I stated, ma'am, we wanna make sure that we provide a safe environment for all of our protectees and whatever measures we would need to put in place uh, for a, a secure site, we would do so. I yield back. Gentle ladies, time's expired. Chair now recognizes the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Mr. Turner from Ohio. Director Cheadle, your opening statement indicates that the Secret Service constructed a security plan for the site in, in Pennsylvania. I'm assuming that security plan would also include the security footprint for the site, but it also would be based upon a threat assessment for the risk threats associated with Donald Trump and the crowd in attendance. Would it not include a threat assessment? Yes, it would. So that threat assessment, as we know, um, basically would have started with this is a generalized threat against Donald Trump because he is a presidential candidate. Then it would have gone to, he's a former president and he gets uh, security coverage just as Bush, Clinton, Carter, Obama do. And then you also have the heightened political environment. Even for those, it's clear that the uh, security footprint, that the threat assessment was insufficient, which permitted then a 20 year old to actually enter with a weapon and shoot Donald Trump. But I wanna ask you about two other aspects of the threat assessment. It is known and public that Iran is a threat risk for Donald Trump. There are threat risks for John Bolton, former Secretary of State Pompeo, and Donald Trump, because they have indicated they want to assassinate them as a result of retaliation for the killing of Soleimani. That is both, uh, for Iran, a generalized threat. They're targeting these individuals, but also, most recently, a specific threat to Donald Trump himself. Now, I want to uh, enter into the record by UC um, a... Uh, a Department of Justice Public Affairs release, a CNN article, a, um, an article from Fox News, and an article from CBS, all of which acknowledge without objection to order that this threat exists for Donald Trump from Iran and that there are specific threats most recently that have been acknowledged. Director Cheeto, have you read the intelligence of the generalized threat to Donald Trump by Iran as a result of? their desire to retaliate for the killing of Salmonelli, excuse me, Salamani. I have. Um, have you 
read or been briefed about the intelligence of the specific recent threat to Donald Trump from Iran? Yes, I have. Director Ray, when we were getting our briefing, indicated that he thought the threat assessment should have included this threat from Iran. Is it your testimony today that the threat assessment, since you've read this intelligence, was sufficient to protect him from this threat from Iran? My testimony today is that the information that we had at the time was known. Uh, that was it sufficient, Director Cheadle, was it sufficient for the Iranian threat that you said you have read the intelligence briefings for? That information was passed to... Well, I'm not asking uh, the bureaucratic issue of who did it get passed around to. Director Cheadle, was it sufficient for the specific and generalized threat to Donald Trump's life from Iran? Yes, I do believe it was. <clears throat> Director Cheadle, is an Iranian assassin more capable than a 20-year-old? Sir, I think we've acknowledged that there was gaps and a failure that day. We when are I not... raised this issue with Director Ray, he was incensed. He, he was shocked that the threat assessment of Iran did not seem to be, as we and I discussed, baked in to your security footprint and your threat assessment. And he went on to say that the generalized threat that he has told the whole country that we are under from a terrorist a potential terrorist threat. He has said we're under the highest threat level since 9-11, that the lights are flashing red. And he has specifically indicated that people have crossed the southern border as a result of the Biden administration's policy and that there are in our country today terrorists and uh, individuals who are affiliated with terrorist groups and organizations. That would be a heightened threat environment, Director Cheeto, would it not? Yes. In his public statements, he has said he is making the these statements because he wants people to take them into consideration in threat assessments, specifically. Mm -hmm. Now that would be a threat not just to Donald Trump, but it would also be a threat to the crowd there, wouldn't it? Yes. Are ISIS terrorists and Al Qaeda terrorists and international groups and terrorists more capable than a 20 year old in pulling off their mass shooting or an assassination of Donald Trump? Sir, again, there was clearly a breakdown Right. and a failure that day. Have you read the intelligence of the terrorists that are currently in the United States that Director Ray speaks, and those individuals that are here that are affiliated with terrorist groups and organizations that are in the process, as Director Ray said, of representing a significant threat of a terrorist attack occurring in the United States? I have read reports that apply specifically to the Secret Service's mission. Director Cheadle, because Donald Trump is alive, and thank God he is, you look incompetent. If Donald Trump had been killed, you would have looked culpable. There is no aspect of this that indicates that there has been any protection to Donald Trump. The threat was, was identified before he took stay, the stage, and the shooter was only killed after Donald Trump himself was killed. Not only should you resign if you refuse to do so, President Biden needs to fire you because his life, Donald Trump's life, and all the other people which you protect are at risk because you have no concept of the aspect that the security footprint needs to be correlated to the threat. I yield back. Chair now recognize Mr. Lynch from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Cheadle, there were multiple security failures at the former president's rally in, in Butler, Pennsylvania. First of all, there was a failure to isolate the podium from exposure to direct fire. Do we know who, ma who made that decision? To, to allow that rooftop to remain as a, a, an, an unprotected area? Do we know who came up with that security plan that, that uh, omitted that? Sir, I don't have uh, a specific person to identify for Okay, you. well, that's what I'm looking for, so let's, let's move on. Uh, there's also a breakdown in security and failure to confront the shooter. Uh, over an hour before the former president began his remarks when the shooter was identified as a person of interest. Um, what particularly allowed agents or, or law enforcement to identify him as a person of interest? So I appreciate the question. And again, I will say that we are nine days out and there are a multitude of interviews that are still taking okay, place. Okay, so did he have a range finder? There were some reports that that the individual had a range finder. That would, that would certainly raise my suspicion 
Uh, did he have a rangefinder? Yes, he did. But may okay. I explain that at a number of our sites, especially when you're at outdoor venues, uh, a rangefinder is not a prohibited item. It is sometimes an item that is brought in by individuals that are going to be. Did in the anybody back. anybody confront him on that? Anybody ask him questions? What are you doing with the rangefinder? Anybody? <laughs> confront him on, on his presence where, where he was in proximity to the president? So again, to my knowledge, I believe that that was the process that was taking place was to locate the individual. Did they, did they confront him? Did they go up to him? Did they talk to him? I do not have those details okay, at this that, time. Those are important details. Uh, there was also a failure to communicate between law enforcement to act quickly uh, upon information provided by either local law enforcement or rally attendees that the suspect was positioned on the roof. There were minutes of delay uh, before um, any, any meaningful action was taken, even though he was several hundred feet from the podium. And uh, this was obviously minutes before the, the shooting. Uh, let me ask you, there was considerable delay in removing the president. Uh, from the podium after the shooting began. He got shot in the ear. It was still a mi over a minute before he was removed from the stage. Meanwhile, this shooter had multiple clips, several clips. He got off eight shots, and he had the capacity and the ability, if he was not neutralized, to, to basically mow down that whole se Secret Service detachment as well as the president. Um, what, from your own investigation, uh, caused that, that delay under the circumstances? What I can tell you is that when the agents uh, identified that the shooting was taking place, in under three seconds, they threw themselves on oh, top of the Oh, I understand that. There was heroism there. No question about it. No question about it. But protocol would indicate, and these are, you know, these are, uh, the, the, the opinions of various former Secret Service agents, people who have uh, done this work in the past, that over a minute of exposure on that podium with, with a, a shooter with a high-capacity weapon who had already wounded the president and, and, and could have got off, we don't know how many more rounds, um, and yet the president remained exposed, even though he was joined in that exposure by the Secret Service in their heroic acts. It just, uh, it, I don't know if there's a good explanation for that. Our personnel created a body bunker on top I, I, of the I president. Get that. I get that. Shielding him. Yeah, this was, this was an AR-15 uh, style weapon that would have made pretty quick work if he, if he was determined and able to do so. This is not the first investigation that we've had of the Secret Service during my time here on this committee. And the last one we had, uh, our previous investigation determined that the Secret Service was experiencing a staffing crisis that poses perhaps the greatest threat to the agency. And that's a quote. Is that staffing crisis still in place? Is that still something that you deal with on a daily basis? As of today, the Secret Service has just over 8,000 employees. We continue to hire. Uh, knowing that we need to ensure that we keep pace with what, a, what would be the full complement of, of and, and uh, gentlemen time's expired but please answer the question yeah i'm sorry what would be the full complement that you're looking for you, you've got eight thousand and how many how many would be a full complement for for the service so we are we are still striving towards a number of 95 uh, 100 employees approximately in order to be able to meet future and emerging needs. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your courtesy, I yield back. Chair recognizes Dr. Fox from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Cheadle, what grade would you give the Secret Service's performance in Butler, Pennsylvania on July 13? As I've stated, ma'am, this was clearly a failure. I would grade the agents and officers who selflessly threw themselves in front of the president and neutralized the threat and A, I think that we need to examine the events that led up to uh, and prior to that day. You stated in 2021 that the Secret Service has a zero fail mission. It's clear that the events of July 13 show a cascade of failures 
that cost Corey Comparator his life, nearly cost former president his life, and injured David Dutch and James Copenhaver. When an agency fails spectacularly at its mission, those responsible must be held accountable and the problems must be fixed so they cannot happen again. Why should the American people or the officials you're responsible for protecting have confidence in your ability to lead the Secret Service after such a spectacular failure? I appreciate the question and I am committed to finding answers so that we can make the agency stronger after this. You said on July 15 that the buck stops with me. How are you taking accountability for the Secret Service's failures during the July 13 assassination attempt on President Trump? I have taken accountability and I will continue to take accountability. I am responsible for leading the agency and I am responsible for finding the answers to how this event occurred and making sure that it doesn't happen again. So I would like to ex explore how you got the job as director of the United States Secret Service. Is it typical for the director of the Secret Service to be recommended for the role at the behest of a president's family and senior staff, perhaps at the request of Jill Biden or Anthony Bernal? I got the job as a director of the Secret Service because I spent 27 years in an agency with a mission that I absolutely love. I started my career in Detroit. I worked my way up through investigations and protection. Were you, was there competition for the position? You would have to ask those who were involved in the interview process. Uh, but you think you are the best person in the country to head the Secret Service? I think that I am the best person to lead the Secret Service at this time. The Secret Service receives billions in funding each year, as has been explained by my colleagues here. In fact, the increase, you've had an increase in real terms of 55%. As you're no doubt aware, staffing levels for those assigned to protect the president, former presidents, and other senior officials has decreased by about 350 between 2014 and today. Clearly a lack of financial resources not a, to blame for the staffing shortage. In 2022, the Secret Service saw nearly half its workforce leave in one year. And during the same year, it was ranked dead last among law enforcement agencies in the best places to work in the federal government. Can you explain why your agency was so poorly rated and why so many staff left in just one year? So with all due respect, I uh, dispute the, the statistic of half of the employees leaving uh, in 2022. I think that that has been inaccurate data that's been reported out there. But what I can tell you is, as I have returned as the director of the agency, we have had an increase in hiring and staffing and an increase in resources. And we are committed to continue to hire uh, so that we can be staffed appropriately to meet the dynamic mission that we have. Well... Uh, you may want to dispute it, but it's out there. My understand, given the high profile, high profile failures and rotten culture at the Secret Service during your nearly two year tenure, why should the American people have any confidence in your ability to lead the Secret Service to perform its zero fail mission to protect our senior leaders? The Secret Service has an incredible culture. Our men and women, place service over self. They come in every day willing to risk their lives for our protective mission. And they work investigations that uh, thwart people who would do harm to children, uh, child exploiters. We have an incredible mission and our culture is, we will get the job done no matter what. Well, those on the front line certainly have a great culture and they were willing to risk their lives for President Trump. But I'm not sure the leadership at the agency has this right kind of culture. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair now recognize Mr. Conley from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I hope the American people do appreciate the incredible daily risks Secret Service agents take on our behalf. You mentioned there are 36 regular clients you've got that you protect constantly. I was participating in the NATO summit just two weeks ago, 
we had 32 heads of government and heads of state plus visiting heads of state and heads of government. Presumably, you provided protection for all of them. That is correct. Just, just saying. Um, help us understand, however, I, I, I will stipulate that there, there's an ongoing investigation. You don't want to go into too much detail on that until you've been able to ascertain all the facts and analyze what they mean. You can understand, however, the anxiety we and the American public have about how could this happen and how can we ensure it can't recur. Now, there are some things my friends uh, uh, on one particular side of the aisle don't really want to talk about, like AR-15s and access to them by a 20-year-old or anybody for that matter. Presumably, uh, Director Cheadle, the ubiquity of weapons, guns in America, especially assault weapons or semi-automatic weapons, that's helped your job and the mission of your agencies, right? It's, it's made it less complicated, isn't that true? I'm sorry, I'm not understanding your question. Real simple, more guns, especially dangerous ones, have made your job protecting people easier. Is that not right? I think at, uh, from every Director Cheetah, this is simple English. More guns, are, do they make your job more complicated or less complicated in protecting these 36 clients and visiting heads of state and heads of government that come to Washington? I think the Secret Service needs to take into account. I didn't ask that. that they're in. I'm, I'm sorry, I asked a simple question, which deserves a simple answer. The ubiquity of guns dangerous weapons in America, like AR-15s, has that made your job, that is to say the mission of the Secret Service, easier or more difficult? I think the threat environment for protecting our uh, Secret Service uh, protectees is always difficult, and that's dynamic, and it's always evolving. We stipulate it's always difficult. I Again, this is a simple one. Do, does the ubiquity of guns make your job easier or more difficult today? I understand the Second Amendment rights of individuals. I didn't ask that question. I'm not questioning the Second Amendment. I'm asking a simple analysis, Director Cheadle. And I can tell you, you're not making my job easier in terms of assessing your qualification for continuing on as director. Please answer the question. You're the head of the Secret Service. You're speaking on behalf of 8,000 members who put their lives on the line. We just had a failure by your own admission. Do guns make your job easier or harder? I think the job of the Secret Service is difficult on every day, and we need to make sure that we are mitigating all threats, whether that be That weapons, isn't my question. Personnel. That is not my question. And now I think you're evading the answer, which is not a hard one. I am sorry that you feel that way, sir. How else could I feel, Director Cheadle, when you're clearly avoiding a direct answer to a very simple declarative question? I'm we almost lost a presidential candidate the other day. A 20-year-old had access to his father's AR-15 and got on top of a roof within 500 yards or feet of the podium. And I'm asking you, did the availability of that AR-15, which is replicated all across America, make your job harder or easier, and you're not willing to answer that question? And you think, and and you wonder why we might have a lack of confidence in your continued ability to direct this agency? I understand your question, and that's the environment. Well, if you understand my question, why not answer it? Because it's the environment that the Secret Service works in every day. That, that doesn't tell me anything. That's the That's the environment we work in. I had, an, I had an attack on my office a year ago. I know a little bit about violence, too. He came to kill me. When he couldn't, he beat one of my staffers eight times with a baseball bat on the head. We live with the threat of violence. But a simple answer from the director of the Secret Service would be helpful. And I'm sorry you've chosen to evade it. I yield back. Chair, now recognize Mr. Grofman from Wisconsin. Thank you. Um, when this guy uh,
took the shots. He climbed a ladder to get on the roof, correct? I'm unable to answer details of exactly how the individual accessed the roof at this time. Do you know when the, uh, if he did use the ladder, do you know when the ladder was placed there? Was the ladder there two days before, just the night before? Do you have any information at all as to when the ladder got there? I would like to be able to